Welcome to this training seminars on geopolitics and integration for the Latin American and Caribbean Union that we have started from the Executive Secretariat of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America, People's Trade Treaty, ALBA TCP. This is the first of a series of seminars on a very specific topic, but one that defines and has defined our history since the first days of, of our existence as republics and even before. We will talk about Latin American and Caribbean unity against imperial geopolitics. It's not a secret that our Latin American and Caribbean continent has been in dispute from day one between Spanish colonization and our freedom and independence. Then British imperialism comes into play until the consolidation of a new hegemon that has led humanity to the serious situations we are living at witnessing today, the United States of America. The United States, since its creation, had and has had an expansionist ambition, not only in terms of territory, perhaps at some point, the territory in the east of the, to the west of the North American continent, the acquisition of Alaska, to have taken away from Mexico half of its territory has not been enough. But rather, it has been expanding politically and geopolitically, designating governments, the armed forces, the army, the economies, and our continent has been between the two currents. The sovereign peoples with their rights to be free, with their self-determination as a fundamental line and the domination of a U.S. corporations over our neighbors. In this sense, we can go back to 1786, look at the date 37 years before the Monroe Doctrine. It is a date just 10 years before the U.S. independence when one of the founding fathers of the United States, former president of the United States, says, said, our confederacy, Thomas Jefferson said, our confederacy must be viewed as the nest from which all America, North and South, is to be peopled. We should take care, too, not to think it for the interest of that great continent, to press too soon of the Spaniards. Those countries cannot be in better hands. My fear is that they are too feeble to hold them till our population can be sufficiently advanced to gain it from them piece by piece. In other words, Thomas Jefferson in 1786, the decade of the 80s, the decade of the 18th century of independence of the United States already foresaw that he hoped that Spain would be able to keep its colonies under control while the United States grew and take them away piece by piece. And that has been our history. Then the Monroe Doctrine, the Manifest Destiny, the Roosevelt Corollary, the Platt Amendment, the invasions, the coup d'etat, CAA operations, and the intelligence mechanism came from the United States to overthrow sovereign processes, to overthrow sovereign governments, to prevent our peoples from moving forward under their own will and determination. That has been the historical framework of our American history. Today, we see a decline in U.S. imperialism, in decline by its own social, cultural, economic, and destructive expressions, but also by the manifestation of its own power. We see a power such as the thesis 
of hyperimperialism that is being developed by the three continental as a research institute there we clearly see how the productive power of production of the United States of America is in decline how the financial power of the dollar and its tools is also being seriously threatened and will soon be replaced by mechanisms such as BRICS as great powers like China, Russia, India and well their unification and the world that is already very clear that the dollar cannot be the instrument of domination but must be the currency of an important power to balance the system and the international order. But the United States still has a great strength, the military, the weapons. War not only as an alternative for the savage domination, as we witnessed this very century with Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, what we have seen in our America, also in Haiti, the aggression against Venezuela, but also what we see between Israel and Palestine, and perhaps the most notable conflict suggesting that the decline is on their way and that another world is emerging, the conflict in Europe between NATO, Western Europe, Ukraine right there at the center of the events, which is obviously a sign that another world is being born that there are birth pains and there is a birth already underway. The aggression against China, the Taiwan case, is also there as an aggression that brings us to the brink of a major conflict, but at the same time, dialectically proves and shows the decline of U.S. imperialism as we have been realizing throughout the years. In this framework, our America, in this multipolar multi world of several centers, our America has a great potential in natural resources, in population, in extension, in glory, as the liberator Simon Bolivar would say, to become a great pole of power, a great center of power, and that is the reason for the determination to keep us divided, fractured, isolated from each other, the people from each other, some countries from others. That is the reason for the determination to promote governments that surrender to imperialism. We have seen recently in Argentina, for example, how the president cedes his territory for U.S. military bases in a strategic zone for that country and the South American continent as governments that open the doors to imperialism in order to divide our America. While there are all governments such as the Bolivarian Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, or the Sandinista Revolution that have really forged the, for the sovereignty of their peoples, linked those peoples and fostered unity. The dispute, as I was saying, has been going on permanently, but between Bolivar and his dream of union, Sandino and his plan for the realization of Bolivar's supreme dream, called the Latin American nationality, there were attempts for unity in the 19th century as well. And then we move on to Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Hugo Chavez, well, this is a historical sequence that inevitably leads us to ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of our America, created and devised by, by Hugo Chavez, accompanied by Fidel Castro, who from 2001 and 2004 developed the idea, the first declaration constituting the alliance was signed in December 2000. And four, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador joined, but unfortunately, due to the return of the neoliberal governments, the Ecuador withdrew. Honduras, which barely enters the coup against the President Zelaya, takes place. The Caribbean countries, San Vincent and the Granada, San Lucia, San Kitts and Nevis, Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda. There we are. Bolivia, of course, with Evo Morales, we are together, and today we are moving forward in this historic dispute with a decadent imperialism, and ALBA is present not only in the political arena, but also as a clear economic agenda 
with a single currency with a development bank with economies potentialities complementing and not competing which is with each other with over two and a half million square kilometers 50 million inhabitants 10 countries but the bolivarian alliance goes beyond the mere formality of those 10 countries tools such as petro caribe transcendent tools of the most social movements of our people becoming becoming unified of the countries that at different levels of sovereignty are uniting their interests and their projects that is alba tcp and that is why resuming bolivar today also means to say to monroe to jefferson to biden to trump to north american imperialism which is which is much more than north american because it is a conglomerate of corporations that are taking over the economic and political system of the countries to say, wait a minute, our America is getting united. Our America has the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. Our America has a SICA, CARICOM, d and community, Mercosur, but also our America has ALBA, which is the project that is directly connected with the PDP with the peoples as in a system of gears, an engine of gears. ALBA is the driving wheel, the first, the smallest, but which move the other gears until it generates a complete mechanism that tomorrow will be CELAC, which is the Amphitheonic Co Congress of Panama, revived 200 years after its convening, which is to be present there. At the last summit, the 23rd held here in Caracas on, a, on a, April 24 this year, it was decided that ALBA would reactivate all areas and it has a 2030 agenda. The president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, was very clear with the rest of the governments, the 10 governments that formally make up ALBA TCP on the need to get ready for the years to come. And that has been the great commitment of our alliance. That's the reason of for this seminar. That's why we are sharing our thoughts, approaches, and necessary analysis aim, first of all, at servants, workers in the international arena, in our foreign ministries, ministries of foreign affairs, integration organizations but even beyond that for any fellow national of the world who is interested in unity and geopolitical issues let's begin by giving the floor to a great analyst of integration Irene Leon a soci sociologist from Ecuador she is a specialist in alternative to globalization. She's part of the intellectual network of artists in defense of humanity. She has made a great contribution regarding Alba TCP. She has written several books on it. She accompanied us at the World Social Alternative Gathering in Caracas on April 18 and 19, and will give us her analysis and reflection on this moment of Latin American unity against imperial geopolitics. Go ahead, Irene Leon. First, I would like to thank Jorge Arreaza, Alba TCP Secretary General, for the call to think about the historical meaning of unity as a political project and a necessary path to full freedom but also to think about it as an unavoidable strategic requirement to respond to the imperialist aggression uh, which affects not only Latin America but the whole world. It is an essential call for several reasons. One of them is because it sets a future outline for a long-standing historical project closely related to the balance of the universe proposed by Bolivar and beyond with ancestral values of interdependence and reciprocity, which now, with the progress of capitalism in the 21st century, 
make a lot of sense. Also, the approach itself breaks, breaks with the systemic projects of, cap of capitalism in the 21st century, which aims at its repositioning through the corporate hegemony, the de facto powers resulting from the globalization schemes and which, in order to take the total market, seek the opposite of union, that is, the disintegration of everything that is collective and state-based. They seek the complete supremacy of private actors and the individual. At the same time, the other color corollary of this new moment of, of the 21st century capitalism is validated through a reorganization of the world with digital technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, and so on, which, as they are now designed, contribute to a society organization focused on individualism, and I insist on the disintegration of all collective projects. For this very reason, here in this time and context, in this regional and world scenario, there is a need for a renewed convergent proposal between the processes of change along with the movements and political organizations that also aim at change. I highlight re the relevance of this invitation to envision union, unity around a possible and necessary horizon such as that of Latin American and Caribbean and Southern integration. This allows to approach unity from a different perspective. Let me stop to say that in the political environment of the last decade, unity has been seen as a frozen concept, as a rhetorical word, and this new approach is interesting because it allows us to focus on unity, on union as a process, and therefore as a multifaceted and living dynamic, which is not exempt of contradictions. And it is a good idea to make this approach from the integration scenarios because in many ways, integration and unity are almost synonyms, and as any related proposal implies process, construction, creativity, ups and downs, but also victories and many challenges, especially if in the case of the sovereign integration, this approach has already been proposed as an alternative as an alternative in power scenarios. In this part of the 21st century, it is no longer an aspiration, a claim of the movements, left-wing parties, politicized sectors. It turned from being a claim to being a challenging project, disputing the meanings of the future, even in the world scenarios. For this reason, among others, our integration proposals are at the forefront of the dispute imposed by the capitalist and imperial forces. Do not forget that with the conservative, conservative restoration, one of the first fronts of attack were the initiative and processes of integration, which are now in a redeployment stage. Therefore, our proposal for sovereign regional integration poses itself as an alternative, and it is an, an alternative because it is the result of a process in which systemic change was and still is a project. It resulted from a series of struggles against neoliberalism and free trade, leading to break with power 
opening ways to disconnect from the capitalist order and especially, especially making it possible to reestablish the region from within. The Alba TCP proposal is an excellent synthesis of this process and the proposals that Chavez and Fidel were able to organize and systematize to produce such unique proposal for systemic change in the world. From my point of view, integration is the most significant project that the region has managed to bring to the future, not only due to the strategic perspective of building a common agenda in the face of globalization, but also because it offers a range of, of possibilities for the development of geopolitical, economic, and sociocultural initiative in line with the patterns of a multipolar world where the Latin American and Caribbean region is a key player in the process. But apart from that, the main element of integration is the internal organization, what Arreaza calls union, and Bolivar called union process. But that's it. It's, it is the internal organization that is at stake. In order to outline the collective future of societies, of our historical societies, which is not only share geography, but also share history and future, no argument is more powerful against imperialism than a united region, which proudly recognizes its historical importance, capabilities, and even its great possibilities of self-sufficiency. Because as mentioned in previous integration processes, the Latin American and Caribbean region can guarantee sustainability and redistribution from any alternative perspective and these are perspectives of economy of economic and productive diversity as is already enshrined in the constitutions of some countries in particular from Venezuela Bolivia and Ecuador from popular and solidarity economy approaches as well, from the principles of economy for life, which is linked with the new proposals, proposals of feminist economy that will deserve to be further analyzed within the ALBA TCP framework, since as Chavez stated, this perspective is a path. So I define integration in order to see unity as a strategic tool which cannot be separated from the concept of sovereignty aimed at the sociopolitical, economic, ecological, and cultural construction of the region through the agreed and participative creation of proposals for complementarity, cooperation, solidarity, and exchange to strengthen internal capacities and promote the consolidation of the Latin American and Caribbean region into a powerful multipolar pole, which will be its way of being in the world. Our integration union is a project for the future, and not a mere alliance of countries to sell products or to compete in the global market. It is the most vi viable proposal for the transition towards other ways of envisioning the region, other ways of seeing the region in the world, and even of changing the world, especially if we manage to position Latin America as a viable multipolar pole, and the proposal of union will be the right way to go. This will be the best way to confront, to fight against imperialist unipolarity, a unipolarity that is co-substantial to the dynamics of the reorganization of capitalism in the 21st century. Thus, we find ourselves between the possibility of choosing the alternative of union 
to create a multipolar pole that opens the way for a systemic transition or continuing along the lines of the unipolar world. For Latin America and the Caribbean, if this proposal was already important from Bolivar's statements and ancestral values, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is now unavoidable given the current reorganization of capitalism, which is already led by the global de facto powers, such as financial capital, transnational corporations, technological media conglomerates, and the military industrial complex of the United States and NATO, which seek to become the omnipotent power at the top of the world and they have been already acting this way for several decades in which these powers try to rule the priorities of world affairs over the states, over the multiple multilateral bodies, and especially over the people. This, which is not long ago, was considered to be part of conspiracy theories is now screaming a screaming reality. We can see it in a corporation and investment fund. It is considered as the third financial power in the world is already on the scene. I'm talking about BlackRock, which brings together countless transnational corporations that manage a large part of the world's pension funds, energy supply, stock market operations, food and pharmaceutical corporations, and so on. These consolidated private sector agents are now a world power. And this is something we have to take into account. They are influential actors in the easy areas where everything is defined, where climate change is defined, in which these agents are actively participating as private sectors with their own NGOs, environments, and with the great influence they have in the majority of countries that express their consent to place capitalism as they wish. They are in the debates of green and digital capitalism in which BlackRock and other corporations have declared the state as an obsolete authority, states are already in the past, according to them, and they prefer direct dialogue with individuals. All this, contrary to any idea of union and unity, they do not want nothing to do with any proposal for redistributing or collective processes. As they speak of love of freedom, that freedom of trade, and the freedom that they don't mention in these scenarios to negotiate face to face, individual versus corporations, or maybe community versus corporations, as is increasingly happening in the Amazon region and in other regions of the world without the presence, neither of states with their own will and even less of organizations, unions, movements that hinder any initiative that they call competitiveness. I insist they do not want sovereign states and even less any integration process that would hinder their plans. They don't want any of that. I went into detail in this description to stress the importance of accurately evaluating this historical moment. For any initiative, but especially for this one, identify and assess the historical moment 
the nature of this reorganization of capitalism and its powers, as well as the strategic directions that our processes of change are taking in order to fight against it. Well, my question is, could it be that while we affirm that capitalism is dying and in full crisis, we ignore the factors that are favoring its reorganization and which is and in which they are very committed? How is it its new model of accumulation being organized? How does this new model based on the power of private conglomerates and digital technologies organize its project for Latin America and the world? I apply these same questions to the interpretation of imperialism because in recent times with these factors, even in the very circles, very close circles of the U.S. establishment, questions have come to be raised, such as who governs that country? The president in power or the military industrial complex? And it is a recurrent question. Currently, for example, we can see how President Biden is providing the elements required for the infinite war, which is a dy dynamic spiral of destruction and reconstruction in which dealers of war materials want to sink the world. So, what is the real situation there? This is an avoidable question to think about our project. And we ask ourselves, with this supremacy of the military-industrial complex, how will the world be under its lead? There is a strategic project, a power player that strives to control the world even beyond the other de facto powers. It is a global power that has already displaced financial capital from, first, from the first place in its headquarters country, the United States, which with these changes is becoming more evident that is fighting for its place as a corporate headquarters for these 21st century capitalist powers and not necessarily as the power it was before. So it is really a wounded beast lashing out or is it a military industrial complex led by market forces with a clear roadmap we are talking about a world power that sells eternal war and different authoritarian models and that go along with the geostrategic design of the total market. The military industrial complex wants to turn the world into barracks and shift the human imaginary towards total barbarism. And the other de facto powers of financial capital, corporations, media and communication complexes show their consent since the parameters for the reconfiguration of capitalism can now only occur with the establishment of global authoritarianism some say global fascism, and this moves forward unless the peoples rise up in defense of the common good, of that supreme happiness that Chavez mentioned, of the defense of life before capital, which at this point has already confronted the ideas of capital life or life or capital. So the unity of the Alba peoples the union as a strategic, geo-strategic project, I would even say, does entail a perspective, an alternative, and this is luckily taking place in Latin America and the Caribbean and has already made progress with challenges to be overcome.
The Alba TCP proposal as a systemic initiative can enable the leadership not only of the movements, organizations, and countries undergoing a process of change, but also of our societies towards values of other categories, such as the strengthening of the proclamation of Latin America and the Caribbean as a zone of peace. Which, ha, which was already stated by CELAC, by ALBA TCP, in previous decades. It should not be forgotten that this type of proclamations are a real and symbolic support for the proposals that our countries place in the world. Recently, the Latin American statement, the proclamation of Latin America and the Caribbean as a zone of peace, prevented the region from being involved in the war in Ukraine when the Latin American countries announced that the region was not interested in getting involved in that war economy. From this point of view, the integration organizations of the 21st century in Latin America and the Caribbean with their challenges, especially ALBA TCP, have already placed on the future agenda a variety of ideas to promote another way of organizing life based on complementarities and agreements, which in times of financial capital domination are challenging approaches. Through this, some countercurrent ideas have been put together, allowing us to move towards another way of organizing the economy as well. As proposed in the new regional financial architecture. This makes sense with the conditions imposed by capitalism at this time, where the power of the private sector is, is of such magnitude that even the same political and geopolitical levels close to capital express concern about the omnipresence of that power whose sole purpose is the accumulation of capital in very few hands. For instance, U.S. antitrust bodies, Congress and the European Union are showing concern, are demanding plans to put a limit to this great power, to this onslaught of the de facto powers of capital, since those sectors are the ones that operate are the, as the spearhead of the renewal of capitalism, as they consider themselves so distant, so exempt from national and international legislations that, as we know, they are creating their own order, their own private system not only for the settlement of disputes, but for the guidelines of life in society as stipulated in the rule-based system. We are facing the dilemma of the importance of the collective interest over the private interest, the importance of a proposal of union as opposed to the disintegration of the common as proposed by capital. In this sense, it is essential to strengthen and deepen the approaches and meanings of integration or union as proposed by ALBA TCP now, because if this has been proposed as a model of adaptation in capitalism, especially for the countries of the South, if it is reinterpreted, if it, if it is reconfigured from other principles as proposed by Alba TCP, this can be a powerful call for the future, uh, a powerful call to coordinate from the South a proposal for a shared future.
And of course, integration and all integration proposals, particularly this anti-systemic integration approach, is in dispute and in a very deep dispute in the Latin American region. And this is not only due to the wealth that Latin America has from water to lithium to clean hydrogen and others, but also because it is an uh, inno innovative project because it, it carries these purposes of change, a change of vision towards a multipolar world of diverse economy and perception in line with the per perspectives of life over the interest of capital. And this comes from our ancestral values, but also because it is the only possible position to resist this onslaught of the so-called 1% of capital. Hence, due to the strategic importance of integration, both for internal development and for the region's relation with the world, Latin America and the Caribbean, which have already proposed not only a project, but this great architecture of integration launched by Chavez, mechanism and diversified initiative reflect a capacity, a possibility to build democratic connections amidst complex socioeconomic conditions where the variety of economic approaches and political trends are presented in a dispersed manner and require these principles, principles of unity, unity of ideas, unity of proposals, unity of perspectives and alternatives. Within this framework, ALBA TCP, which has been contributing since its foundation with basic contents for a systemic alternative connected with multipolarity, has a central role because thanks to be less heterogeneous as others, it is present and it is proposing redefinitions. These redefinitions allow, among other things, if they are considered broadly, to build a shared environment focused on the common good, mm, to look for agents sharing different uh, approaches and aspects of these perspectives, sharing the proposals of a new financial architecture, sharing the proposal of these internal economies, which is possible and the only way out for our region. With these principles and with this renewed convening capacity, it is possible to continue in this dispute because, as we know, integration in the region is vulnerable, vulnerable to these geoeconomic and political power relations. In this context, where the forces of capital seek the fading of geopolitical, multilateral, and sovereign bodies in order to prioritize their market alliances to benefit the great transnational conglomerate powers. In short, Latin America and the Caribbean have opened a space to think about this perspective of integration with, with this new approach to union from a vision of sovereignty in a context of high historical tension in which there are, on the one hand, these alternative proposals to change the relations of a socio-economic and geopolitical exclusion in which the region lives and to propose far-reaching processes and structural changes with horizons such as those of the 21st century socialism, good living, living well, 
which imply civ civilizational alternatives. But also the forces of this radical capitalism are very present in the region. Forces that are connected to these global factual powers, to this corporate model of stateless capitalism, where capital is presented as a stateless pole of society coordination, where local political conservatism actors are also connected to these possible stratagems to avoid the positioning of alternatives, including regional integration, and to prevent the version of this total market capitalism from gaining territory. Not only the analytical bodies of what is happening in society are in dispute, but also the visions on the results, on the mechanism, the instruments to promote these alternatives towards a geopolitical justice of sovereignty, towards a fairer world. In this context, the union proposed by Alba TCP can be a very important instrument to promote organizational processes and calls for action at the moment. For example, from union, we can foster spaces uh, to question the dynamics of fina financing and debt that affect not only the countries, but also the peoples. In this context of changes in which capitalism is now pushing, the peoples uh, can also, base, uh, based on the principles of union, call and take political actions to mobilize from the south towards initiatives with results. For example, in the face of the Palestinian cause, it is possible to take initiatives that peoples can do, such as boycott campaigns, campaigns um, against Israeli products or disinvestment in those countries which can, can be carried out uh, from different poles. Thus, we can develop this perspective of union to bring about change. And we, the peoples, can once again join our voices just at, as it happened at the beginning of this century against free trade. We can once again manage to come together to sanction the capital forces that impose collective measures, such as the unilateral coercive measures against Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. We can predict reactions to corporations such as ExxonMobil, which after certifying the oil in the Esequibo, linked his proposal to the U.S. decision to declare Venezuela as a unusual and extraordinary danger. We can show these realities uh, under the cri criteria of union in diversity, as stated in Bolivar's proposal up to now, and uh, activate a wide range of people who are not satisfied who are not happy with this radical onslaught of capitalism now called libertarianism, taking over the ideas of freedom in a conceptual way. So the union as a proposal, as a concept, as a political initiative, is a strategic resource here and now, a very important strategic resource to encourage this path towards a systemic change, seeing union, of course, as a process under construction, not as an end itself but as a multifaceted, complex and contradictory process, but in these times, it has to be built and understood as part of the defense of the collective, of the interdependence 
dependence of the humankind as a defense of life and not of capital, as the proposal of capitalism in the 21st century has put it, this proposal of total market to which the world has to resist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. Uh, it was an excellent, comprehensive reflection of, on our process of unity. I want to highlight uh, your stress, Irene's stress, on how corporates disintegrate us, separate from each other, and attack the collective, and how they insist on the individual uh, has a reflect on in all areas of society. That is why just as social networks are isolating human beings, imperialism is also isolating countries so that they don't come together, so that they don't unite. And this is definitely the case. Also to see as a living process, the process of unity, which is not exempt of contradictions, dialectic processes, progress, obstacles, setbacks. Uh, I think it is extremely valid to see it that way, but also to see our con uh, integration as an almost transitional process towards a new world, towards a new systemic organization as only those poles of power, in our case the Latin American pole of power, can lead to a balance in the world. The balance of the universe, as liberator Simon Bolivar would say, so that there will be another way of understanding and organizing. I think it is essential that this sovereign integration flows towards a systemic transformation as when the state is attacked, the processes of unity are also diluted. That is why we must protect the state and ensure that our states take back their strength and, and don't allow themselves to be replaced by a large business conglomerates such as BlackRock, for example, which has greater power than many other powers of our world, wars and accumulation, who rules the world, the industrial, military and technological complex run by the market, or should it be the peoples of who govern themselves? That, it is, that is where our ALBA comes in as an alternative with a true systemic aspect. How from integration, from the union with our ALBA TCP, we can change the reality of our America and help to change the world. Extraordinary speech by Irene, dear friend and Professor Pedro Sassone, director of the Venezuelan Academy of Diplomatic Studies who was also at the forefront of the unity process from Alba TCP itself, but especially in UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations. He was in the Secretariat representing Venezuela, but he was part of the construction of the structure of UNASUR. And we know that he also has a great geostrategic criterion, and he's going to teach us a lot. Go ahead. I will talk about a fundamental topic related to Latin American thought, which has to do with the processes around the concept of unity. Unity as a fundamental element from a political perspective. Initially, I would like to say that the central conception of unity must be redefined in terms of thinking and understanding it as a doctrine. It is not just an isolated concept. When we talk about doctrine, we are talking about a set of concepts and relationships, definitions and identities from a historical perspective. Therefore, in Latin American thought, and in the thought of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, the doctrine of unity that has been de developed, in this case from Commander Chavez and President Nicolás Maduro, has made conceptual contributions. Today, it is conceived as a central axis in terms of pursuit of politics 
what we have called the policy of peace diplomacy. This doctrine has a central foundation which is Bolivarian thought. That is to say, its historical foundation is the ideal of the liberator. It is the ideal of unity of the republic. It is the ideal of creating a great homeland. This central element marked all the development of the independence process from uh, 1811 until the death of the liberator in 1830. Let us remember that Bolivar's concept of unity is a central concept for achieving independence. Independence couldn't not have been achieved without the concept of unity. The concept of the Republic was the element in the construction of unity and power. We, we were a great power and this was achieved through a journey that began with the Battle of Carabobo and concluded in the Battle of Ayacucho. Carabobo led us to Pichincha, Pichincha led us to Junín and Junín led us to Ayacucho. This is a common thread within the thought of the great homeland. There was no way to defeat the old Spanish colonialism without integration. And indeed, it was achieved in this way. It was the liberating armies. It was the armies that were formed throughout history. It was the leadership of Bolívar, the leadership of the Grand Marshal of Ayacucho in sequential victories. Therefore, today, speaking about unity is speaking about the Bolivarian thought. That leads us to another fundamental element, which is that in the concrete experience, of how we have come from Venezuela, from Commander Chavez to President Maduro, we propose the need to transcend beyond the traditional thinking of integration, beyond purely economic integration, to think about a concrete unity, a unity in a comprehensive approach that covers political, economic, social aspects, security, and defense, and ultimately unity in terms of the fundamental problems of Latin America and the Caribbean. We start from the notion that it's not possible to overcome structural problems in terms of building and an economic base, developing our own industry, achieving independence and sovereignty in the ideological field, industrial development and education, without building a platform of unity among the Latin American peoples with direct participation of the peoples as subjects of integration. From this perspective, integration and unity in Latin America have unfortunately gone through through different stages. There has not been a vision to sustain it over time. It has been destroyed at certain moments. In the latest stage, neoliberal conceptions have started to prevail again. Neoliberalism has a core principle, which is disintegration. Therefore, in this stage, we have seen two opposing forces. The force of disintegration represented by the old neoliberal model the, the neoliberal model is inherently disintegrative because it separates the whole, separates participation in the collective vision of the nation, separates relations between countries, and separates concepts of complementarity and cooperation among countries. Consequently, a trend has been imposed, and throughout history we find that once again the United States plays a role in breaking up and influencing countries to end integration processes. UNASUR was closed and frozen. Uh, they tried to close CELEB. ALBA has been resisting in this process. Therefore, it is a political dynamic in terms of a correlation of forces. The need of for left-wing movements and left-wing governments is essential to resume the integration process. It is a historical necessity to now resume the integration
migration processes by assessing what has been achieved. In the case of UNASUR, for example, regardless uh, of the current state, of destructuring and being frozen in time due, due to political relations where neoliberalism uh, has been prevailing, there are significant achievements. There are achievements from a shared history, important achievements in existing institutional frameworks, an important consensus on various fundamental issues. Therefore, Resuming the path of unity process and a broad, comprehensive conception today uh, involves assessing what has been achieved. It involves institutional experience. In this case, ALBA is called upon to play uh, an important role uh, as a coordinator of advanced anti-imperialist political thought and a political thought that leverage the potential and capacities of countries for self-construction in terms of progress and conceptual uh, constructions. In this dynamic, in terms of assessing what has been achieved, it is important to build a methodology for comparison and evaluation of each reference, whether institutional or in terms of consensus or political content, because there are significant political contents that have been achieved. The political contents, for example, in the UNASUR Defense Council, where progress was made in the construction of a defense document in electoral matters, progress was made in preserving and strengthening uh, democracy. In energy matters, progress was made in transforming energy as an important means and it is worth worth mentioning some important assets, always remembering our friend and comrade Ali Rodriguez Araque. Ali Rodriguez used to say there is a fundamental element that, that must be an axis in the integration processes, which is the sovereign perception of natural resources that is the need to add value to them. Industrial processes and technological development to Today, this statement and vision are highly relevant, especially when natural resources have become the center of global political disputes, and Venezuela has great global potential in, in oil, gas, and biodiversity. From that point and analyzing within the framework of the global geopolitical landscape, a geopolitical framework that is in transition, a framework in dispute, a dispute between two or multiple forces at once. One force seeks to impose the old unipolar world to impose old hegemonies that refuse from the perspective of action and concrete reality to accept that another world is in progress, that there are other power blocks and other reference in terms of relations with countries. However, this old unipolar world whose fundamental axis is related to war strategy contrast with the emerging multipolar world. We aspire for a multipolar world where international law is once again placed as a central foundation, a multipolar world based on respect for countries, respecting differences and peaceful coexistence among peoples, a multipolar world for humanity and peace. In this context, between the old unipolar world that refuses to yield to new realities, such as the BRICS nations, Russia, China, and countries like Venezuela, which create and develop a new philosophy of peace diplomacy, there is no way to influence this emerging world without unity. Without unity uh, and cooperation among countries based on their capabilities. 
If we are divided, we will not be able to influence the new shaping of the world. In other words, it is about transitioning from being an object to becoming an international political subject. Becoming an international political subject requires building power blocks through unity and cooperation among peoples, countries, and nations. Therefore, this is the great historical challenge. It is the dilemma, once again, of 1830, the dilemma of the death of the liberator. Once the liberator physically disappeared, all that power formation of Gran Colombia disappeared as well. As, and we were left with, with a small republic. Thus, history seems to once again confront us with, the, with that dilemma. Either we unite or we will not have the capacity to influence this shaping world. We will only become a subsidiary territorial space without the ability to influence transformation and agendas. This is the challenge, and within this fundamental challenge, it is evident that Alba strengthening select and resuming UNASUR play a strategy role. That is how Commander Chavez defined it and how our president Nicolas Maduro has outlined it. Excellent, Pedro Sassone. Uh, we didn't expect less, dear professor. Unity as a doctrine, not only as a process, as a goal, but as a doctrine that was born in the case of our America from the doctrine of the liberator Simon Bolivar, from the path to independence. Uh, look, uh, that is why the liberator put it on the table from day one. We are not only going to make a country, Venezuela, independent, but to be truly independent, we must unite the independent republics to achieve true autonomy, true independence. It is an integral unity, as Pedro Sazón says. And of course, neoliberalism, the dispute, how it is disintegrating us. This coincides with Irene León, how these processes of neoliberal corporations are disintegrating us while our union brings us, bring us together from the peoples and to all areas of society. The analysis of UNASUR as a great challenge, as perhaps the integration mechanism in this case in South America that has evolved the most in less time with a functional and useful institutional framework that even reached deep topics such as energy sovereignty or defense sovereignty in the military field, where in the face of diversity, uh, there was unity. Governments such as Hugo Chavez and Alvaro Uribe Vélez agreed on the criteria to make progress in the integration in defense or energy matters. Definitely, UNASUR was and will be a counter-hegemonic integration element, and that is why uh, it was attacked, and that is why it has been frozen by imperialism in the first place, but we hope to see to see it emerge soon as Latin and Caribbean strategy, its natural resources are a guarantee of independence. And since only united, we can influence geopolitically, geostrategically geostrate in the emerging world. If we don't really unite, if we don't continue with our integration progress from Alba TCP and Tower Select, unfortunately, we will have a multipolar world where we are not even a pole in sight with influence. They need to develop our block, not to go back and remain in dilemmas, but to move forward towards unity and, of course, with the spirit of Alba TCP in mind. Thank you very much, Professor Pedro Sazon. I will give you the floor to Professor Felix Valdez from Cuba. He is a renowned researcher at the Institute of Philosophy in Havana, but he specializes mainly in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean identity, in its political figures and liberation processes as well. Let's listen to Professor Felix Valdez. 
Well, first of all, I want to thank the organization of this seminar, the American Unity Against the Imperial Geopolitics and its organizers, to Nerlini, to his moderator, Jorge Arreaza, who will be with us and other researchers, the scholars of these topics. On of course, the issue of imperial geopolitics from capitalist colonial domination, then imperialism, who has the same predatory interests and the unity and Latin America as a protective shield to this situation will be the topic that calls us together. I would like to focus on the Caribbean islands. Cuba, uh, the Caribbean, and uh, I would like to start um, talking, mentioning uh, writer and politician Dominican ousted President Juan Bosch, who wrote with some urgency a book uh, in Spain and being Dominican invaded by the United States, he wrote a book called From Cristobal, Christopher Columbus to Fidel Castro, The Caribbean Imperial Frontier. According to this author, former president of the Dominican Republic, it was imperative to argue how this space from the very beginning of the European occupation in 1492 until today, of which he was victim, was an area marked by the appetites of the colonial capitalist domination and and in particular by the North American imperialism. Is with the arrival of Christopher Columbus' ships, the invaders claimed the New Island's territories believed to be the Indies, and they awarded to the Castilla and León for the Catholic monarch. Isabel and Ferdinand were territories visited for church, and Christopher Columbus wrote in his notes. Later, the sworn friends of Spanish domination arrived, a black legend was plotted, and other European empires came, here to settle here. The forged space, the Arawak was already undone, and even more destroyed, divided, and fragmented. The islands went offline, and they were unaware of each other. Spain abandoned them, and then began to have its enemies in the same house right in front its American possessions. Jorge Manage is a philosophy professor from the University of Havana between 1940 and 1960, concerned about the political and cultural borders, affirmed that the border issue, that the island arc was like a raised arm to separate one cultural linguistic world from other, to distinguish our America from Anglo-Saxon America. Manash was a friend of Pedro Albizu since university at Harvard. He was a Jose Martí specialist. There is a formidable biography of him. Martí the Apostle, and he knew about the independence privilege of the Puerto Ricans and the attempts that were made to achieve an Antillean confederation. It was a project that was like a kind of protective chill of the greater islands, promoted at the end of the 19th century uh, by Ramón Emeterio Betances, Eugenio María de Hostos, José Martí, Gregorio Luperón, and other politicians and intellectuals intellectuals from the Caribbean. It was about the integration of the islands, especially the greater ones, uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and with them, what they intended was to guarantee the end of the Spanish colonial domination and confront the thriving imperialism who already at this time lurked, as Martí would say, like a tiger frightened by the lash, but it comes back at night to place of the dam, and you don't hear it because it comes with the velvet paw. Martí said, in the days when the Cuban intellectual Jorge Manage intended to teach his course in Rio Piedras in 1961, he was also rehearsed in this space, the island space, the Caribbean space, another project was being tried of the West Indies, Indies federations, an attempt to unite the Anglo-Saxon islands that were pretending the independence of the English-speaking islands uh, from 1958 and 1962, and who received uh, a lot of intellectual energy of a politician and scholar, Eric Williams, who later 
was president of Trinidad and Tobago. So the island space, which, which was the matrix from which Spanish domination branched out to the rest of America, they were the first years of arrival and dissemination of the Spanish for the rest of the continent. It was always the subject of dispute. It was a desired space, not for the incalculable mineral wealth, not the great productive capacities and market that this space has, but because of the place it occupies for the strategic physical space, the geography. So in the 42, Spain, France, England, Netherlands, Germany, and Sweden even arrived to establish the capitalist productive change, which was characterized by the distribution, the packages, the fleet system, enslavement of sub-Saharan Africans, and the agricultural plantation model. All of them part of the system of wealth extraction that allowed the enrichment of metropolis in a calculated business, they ended up to the European coffers, the gold, sugar, cocoa, coffee, tobacco, oil, and then the bauxite. The islands are today, uh, today are plantations. They are also plantations, species for leisure, cruises, beaches, sun, music, tourist services, a space to be used to generate wealth, but riches that are consumed outside. Only the use of a space, just as the agricultural plantation was. The English, the French, they planted their sugar factories. They brought the workforce, the technology, but the sugar was consumed outside the islands. Four centuries later, the beginning of the European invasion, imperial geopolitics intensified with the energy and the slave blood started what was called the Industrial Revolution or Industrial Revolutions. From the 70th of the 19th century, India, Oceania, and parts of Asia, they were swept away. Africa was broken up by the European empires in 1885. They divided as they liked it, while the British consolidated their power and expanded around the world with great power. We started like that, began to leave another rearrangement, let's say imperial colony. In America, it was the United States detached from England. Since 1823, they launched their Monroe Doctrine. Also later, the Manifest Destiny, the Big Stick, the Roosevelt Corollary came, the Truman Doctrine, until, say, the good neighbor. Because they, as Simon Bolivar said, they thought they were destined by Providence to plague America of misery in the name of freedom. The United States, in this hemisphere, they had already already spread towards the west of their region. They had massacred the Native American in their lands of, to Mexico. They took from Mexico 50% of the territory. They bought Alaska from the Russians. At the, a great industrial and communication boom began with excessive capital, financial products, and needed a space to carry out and to guarantee the unequivocal money formula, merchandise money. Raw materials will be safe if obtained for their south. They wanted to consolidate economy and monetary dominance in the hemisphere, and that's why it was organized in the late 80s of the 19th century, the International Pan-American Conference, and then the Monetary Conference, which they attended. For example, Jose Martin. However, he needed to specify the age coastal, the border limit with the islands, with the space, with the Caribbean basin. As they say, an American national security of North, Northern Empire passed to secure this watery territory using new strategies of domination and com communication, not to establish the domain, the colonial style of the 15th, 16th century, but to dominate economic, politically, manage destinies of these new republics, guarantee the supply of coal for ships, ensure routes, ports, and markets. And in this case, the Straits of the Sea, what characterizes the Ark Island divided by the Sea Strait. To the west, they became strategic. And this is how Cape St. Nicholas in Haiti, the Mona Passage, VX, the existence of the Dominican Republic from Haiti, Cuba, Puerto Rico, 
para lo cual es They were spaces for which it was clear to the United States that needed to be controlled and subdued. Of course, 1898, that year was already the final blow. Consolidation is gone of a new time in relationships between the United States and everything that comes to the South, passing through the Caribbean, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. The Philippines were this year uh, the first imperialist uh, war, and so it is considered. The United States entered the Cuban War against Spain. A treaty was signed in Paris, and Cuba was occupied for four years, while Puerto Rico since then has played different denominations, but denominations of dependency. Haiti and Dominican Republic later were occupied, that is, 15 years later. After the 20th century began, there is an American writer Mark Twain, well known, very well known, very relevant to English literature, generally very translated to the whole world, who considers that from that time he uh, became anti-imperialist. Anti-imperialist when learning about the war in the Philippines and the shameful consequences that this war was bringing to the world before everyone's eyes that caused the life of more than the life that one more one million Filipinos. He declared himself against imperialism. He didn't want more that the North American eagle will fly over the Pacific, nor that the symbol of American power put its claw in any other land in the world. Human massacres in the Philippines uh, already caused too much pain. However, we have its opposite. Rudyard Kipling, an Indian writer, which wrote for the Jubilee from the Queen of England in 1899 a poem titled The White Man's Burden, with nothing more offensive than his verses, when he says, take the white man's burden to serve your captive's need, to serve with combat equipment to the tumultuous and savage nations. The newly conquered Filipinos, your new cold, solemn peoples, happy, says Kipling, half devil, half a child. That is to say, Filipinos are demons and children. This Indian writer, and the saying fits very well for that, that says that there is no worse wage than the one of the same wood, he wrote with fallacious content about the colorful colonized peoples, not white, let's say, as was his own. He repeated the verse, take up the white man's burden to enslave, dominate, to dominate ungrateful people, to walk on path where you will you will never walk, and behold the laziness and wild ignorance. Kipling said it was for the queen, not a poem, it was an ode. It was an hymn of English imperialism to North American imperialism that destroyed the Philippines. A praise to vilification to Compton with full and inhuman arrogance. He bequeathed a scandalous poem to the evil. In 1898, uh, one era was sealed and another was opened. The domination of our America, the Yankee hegemony in the hemisphere. Mark Twain, this American writer aforementioned, who was not Nobel Prize winner in literature, as Roger Kipling was in 1909, said that Jose Martí was the founder of an anti-imperialist thought in Latin America just as Francisco de Miranda or Simón Bolívar had been. Whoever would like to see in America the greatest nation in the world, less for his size and wealth than for his freedom and glory, he said, José Martí maintained almost seven decades later that the people of America are freer and more prosperous the further they move away from the United States. This was clear to José Martí. That's why Twain says, affirms, uh, this. In his time, uh, Martí understood the artist's historical mission to achieve independence from the last colonies of Spain on the continent, 
Puerto Rico, and Cuba. And he says that the three major islands of the Caribbean, in the essence of their independence, the aspiration of the future, stretch their arms over the seas and embrace, embrace each other before the world like three cuts of the same bleeding heart, like three guardians of a warm and true America. And it is these islands that we finally surpass the greedy America. To give the islands their space, the independence of, of the islands from Spain will position them as protectors of America. There was no doubt in, in the faith of America are the Antilles, who, which would be, if enslaved, a mere bridge in the world of an imperial republic against the jealous and superior world that is already preparing to deny it power. And if free, there will be on the continent the guarantee of balance, the independence for Spanish America still threatened. Jose Martí was completely certain that with the possession of the islands by the United States, this empire will open up against the powers of the world for world domination. We will reach very high due to the kind end. Martí considered, or we will fall very low for not having understood it. It is a world that we are balancing. It is not just two islands that we are going to liberate. The apostle of Cuban independence was very lucid regarding the imperial threat posed by the United States. Of course, another like him, the very dignified Furman, a uh, Haitian diplomat, writer, anthropologist, was warned uh, of the same situation. And that's why Martí wanted to meet him in Washington in 1891 on the occasion of the Herencia Conference in the late 80s, that is, with the Pan American Conference, the Monetary Conference. He wanted to meet him and couldn't have access to him. That's why Ramon Emeterio Betances told him to go to see him in Cap Haitian before arriving in Cuba, which was when he was ready to undertake what he called the generous and brief war for independence of Cuba. And for me, it was that intellectual, that politician who, with great dignity, rejected the attempts of the United States for taking over the San Nicolas Mall, and he has neutralized the arguments of the illustrious scientists of the anthropology of Paris in the 80s, 15, 10 years before, when they wanted to prove the inferiority of the black men. That was one of the fundamental ideological arguments used to justify the dismemberment of Africa. Undoubtedly, trying to demonstrate the inability of the black men is valid for the imperial arrogant position. And Martí knew it so much that when Martí dies in Dos Ríos, in his bag, it is presumed that he kept summaries from the main book by Antenor Fermín. Uh, Government followers who were desperately seeking data to prove the racial inferiority of non-Europeans were met with Fermin's challenge in his book entitled The Equality of Human Races, which consisted of 500 pages, a book where he dismantled through on the floor all those supposed scientific arguments who endorsed white superiority above black inferiority. Uh, that is to say, the racist ideology that was asked served and justified those imperial appetites, and you don't have to go far. A few years later, the elevation in Russia of the supposed existence of an Aryan race turned out very expensive for the European world itself because it was the main nerve of German fascism. As we had said, the fortress and the cove that separate Haiti from the coast of Cuba couldn't be taken by the United States as a naval base or coal base. But there was such a clear warning of one and others that from Furman, from Jose Martí, of the imperial threat that after the occupation of Cuba and the amendment to the Cuba Constitution, the shameful amendment, plat amendment, is settled. It was created. That was uh, the objective of imperial domination, the Guantanamo naval base, plus others, coal bases, coal mines on the Cuba island that will guarantee the maritime domain of the United States.
Uh, as we said, for Martí, the independence of Cuba and Puerto Rico was the guarantee for the America. Cuba couldn't be wrong, he said, in his historical mission. That's why in his last written to his friend Manuel Mercado, just the night before leaving for the fight and dying from an enemy bullet, he says, I'm already in danger every day of giving my life for my country and for my duty. To prevail in time with the independence of Cuba, that the United States extend their dominion over the Antilles and fall with even greater force upon our lands in America. This phrase is a repeated saying, and yet uh, today is a mortifying to see so much battle lost in our worlds. When the U.S. is gaining and staying in the limelight of the cultural and symbolic war day after day with the merits that arises us, where we see there are so many people captives of North American domination, while for Marti, what he says, I am already in danger of giving life. I was trying to prevent with the independence of Cuba that they spray, they fall in America. Of course, we are speaking in the 1898, the beginning of the 20th century, the fortification of capitalism, a new stage in development of capitalism that doesn't fit into its territorial extensions, the era of imperialism, the period of the new imperialism, the entrance, the English arrogance throughout the African continent, the Germans trying to fight in his space in the colonial world, the Bismarck conundrum on the Willem the second matter, but this whole situation made Marx, who had written the capital and the followers of it, and many Marxists, mainly American Marxists, fundamentally militants and theorists of the major party that existed in Europe at that time, the German Socialist Democracy, they had as a uh, purpose of analysis all this new period what's happening in the development of capitalism, what what new stage we are living. Uh, why Job Hobson wrote a test in 1902, which he called imperialism and study, or that Hilferdin, another theorist, member and supporter who participate in the German social democracy, and Austrian social democracy wrote the financial capital in 1910. Rosa Luxemburg, the great brave woman, faced all the machismo, the entire pat patriarchal tradition within the German social democratic party, dedicated herself after many unlucky moments she had in her personal life to write Try to write what Marx had not achieved. The text called The Accumulation of the Capital, which is published in 1913. Other theories, like Bukharin or even Lenin himself, who wrote the result of all these debates, and those who knew him very well, and they were very interested in creating a text that's been translated into Spanish as imperialism, higher face of capitalism. In addition from other militant members of the German Social Democratic Party, Henry Gaylor, Sir Henry Brice Ford, uh, were object of analysis and debates about this new period of imperial development characterized by Lenin as a period of concentration of capital. The remarkable results of the production of goods and growth of financial capital, uh, growth of sport without limits, the rise of monopolies, the outflow of capital to the international arena, to the domination of foreign spaces outside of these great imperial powers. The, this topic didn't escape to the debates, nor to the critical analysis of this era. This phase of capitalism, nor the threat that what it meant in practical life, in political behavior of a party like the German Social Democrats, and in particular the remarkable work of Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin on this topic, on the analysis of this problem. Uh, however, 
Uh, we have to see the opportunism threat, the comfortable and self-interest revisionist of Marx, direct hires of his theo theoretical legacy such as Bernstein, Bebel, Kautsky, seduced by participation in parliament, didn't want to see, as Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin did later, what it meant to push the limits borders of modern nation states towards what the colonial world was. Because according to Rosa, the suffering would double and would come the war, which was not uncertain. The First World War came just for these reasons. That's it. For them, it was an academic de debate either, but practical political disagreements. And Rosa fought with the leaders of the German Social Democracy Party, and they criticized her as a woman. And as a theorist, they were very harsh in the Congress of the 1909-1912. They even sanctioned her. However, Rosa Luxemburg was clear that England brandished the whip and filled India with diseases and thus dissolved in Africa. She questioned the Morocco case, the entrance of Germany in Morocco, and she said it was due to the internal development of German militarism and German desire to have global power. However, there was not a single word about the natural inhabitants of the colonies, Rosa said. There is not a word about the rights, the interests, and the suffering. Due to international politics, uh, there is no word on the alleged splendid uh, politics of uh, colonial England, any mention of the periodic famines and the spread of typhoid fever in India, no talk of extermination of the Australian aborigines or weapons with hippo leathers on the backs of the Egyptian people. The First World War came to confirm everything that they predicted and the participation of Germany signified to the German social democracy. To Rosa Luxemburgo, Lenin, the defining disaster. War was the way to exercise this policy that they criticized. In our America, as we have said, the imperialist threat before and after 1898 has been real. And that's why, at different times, different integration mechanisms have appeared as political and economic alternative, also cultural protection, as alternatives that have been thought, rehearsed, practiced, not always achieved, with all that Bolivar envisioned uh, for us until today, but they have been an armor or could be considered as possible protective shells in the face of these uncontrollable appetites from the colonial times to times in the face of barbarism and the dismantling of our American societies. And this is the reason of our conversation. I appreciate it very much. I have allowed myself to say these things, looking at the world from the Caribbean, from these island spaces like no other, and the are at the front line of the imperial threat that remains alive until this day. Thank you very much, Alba, Alba TCP, to Petro Caribi, to all the attempts to confront, to challenge the order to which we are supposedly imposed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Valdez Garcia. It is very important, especially for the countries of our Latin America, to understand the Caribbean, its own processes of liberation and domination, which do nothing but unite us as a complete body, our Latin America and the Caribbean, so that we can disregard that thesis that one thing is Latin America and another thing is the Caribbean because of a linguistic barrier and other elements that we can identify. But on the contrary, we are victims. We have been victims of colonial domination, victims of new imperialism, and we are together in this battle to understand how Latin America and the Caribbean in a great protective shield, as Professor Valdez said, as there was the dispute between Anglo-Saxon American and our America. Jose Martí gave it that beautiful name, our America.
also processes of dispute and confrontation, how they try to move towards a West Indian Confederation with Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Greater Antilles. They were ready to confederate, but it was not possible. But even the Anglo-Caribbean countries tried to make their federation of East Indies, and they didn't succeed either, but there were attempts. And today, those countries meet, embrace, embrace each other in Alba TCP, and we are moving towards our own union that will be a confederation in what will be tomorrow the project of liberators of CELAC constituted from its peoples. That is not important. The important thing is to move forward, and even today, the wealth of our Caribbean is in that territory, but is exploited, exploited outside. Uh, tourism, entertainment, casinos, even some cultural elements can be developed in the territory, but the profit, the wealth, goes abroad. The anti-imperialist spirit of Mark Twain, uh, for example, one, uh, was one of the clearest expressions and stories that Professor Valdez offered us. And as Martí said, in order for the peoples to be freer and more prosperous, it is necessary for them to move away from the United States. I believe that Martí had a very important point that focuses us on this historical moment and how from the Bolivarian Alliance for the peoples of our America, the countries of our Latin America and our Caribbean America united, we can forge this alternative. Thank you very much, dear comrade Valdez Garcia. And now let's introduce uh, a brother, uh, Sergio Rodriguez uh, Helfenstein, someone I know from many years ago. He's a researcher, an expert in many topics of geopolitics, international relations. He's a researcher of a new institute in Venezuela, Pueblos Institute, which will be developed original thinking. And he's also an expert in Latin American integration and also in the ancestral China and its geopolitical role in the world. But he's focusing this time on our America. We want to see how Sergio approaches the Alba TCP and the Latin American Caribbean integration processes. Go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much to the ALBA General Secretariat for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate. Based on the proposed theme, I have drafted a paper entitled ALBA Proposal for the Future of Latin America and the Caribbean. Talking about ALBA requires a historical re retrospective analysis to trace the origins of this proposal. I will take some time uh, with your permission. Uh, I will go back in history to understand the historical context in which Bolivar's struggles took place to study his legacy, which is still present today, because we can build an alternative to neoliberalism based on Bolivar's ideas. The history of our independent America uh, the life of our peoples, our countries and independent countries, from Spanish, Portuguese, British, French colonialism, the history of the struggle of our independent peoples is the history of the confrontation between two ideas. We emerge as independent countries amidst a confrontation of two ideas, the Monroeist idea and the Bolivarian idea. James Monroe, Monroe developed a foreign policy for the United States which was aimed at keeping Europeans away from America. Do not interfere in the process of expansion that we have in this region of the world, which is a region destined by God to be dominated by the United States. This is the origin of the manifest destiny. Monroe's idea, which is he presented in December 1823 in a speech before the US Congress, was replied to almost immediately by Bolivar. It was the climax of the independence struggle. In 18 
1824, two days before the Battle of Ayacucho, he summoned the peoples, the independent countries, to meet in Panama for a congress to lay the foundations of Latin American unity, the basis for the unity of the new independent countries. So, these two ideas, the United States idea, Monroe's and Bolivar's idea, enter into Estados conflict. The United States begins to develop its idea of integration. What was that? The Pan-American idea, based on an integration in which the U.S. was allegedly going to stand side by side with us equally. This idea is opposed to the Bolivarian idea, which proposes that the countries from the south of Rio Bravo, the Latin American, uh, like Martí called our America, the Latin American and the Caribbean countries should build our own identity or our integration process. This conflict between the U.S., the Pan American, the Moro idea, and our idea, the Latin American and Caribbean idea, the idea of our America, as Martí called it, is still unresolved. The Bolivarian idea was frozen in time after the death of the Liberator in 1830, and it seemed to be totally defeated, and it could no longer have a place in our continent. This idea whereby Latin Americans and Caribbeans of all latitudes should be united seemed to have disappeared in the future project for our region. However, already in the 19th century and even part of the 20th century, there were uh, attempts to continue Bolivar's idea, perhaps to build an ALBA at that time without the U.S. In 1847 and 1848, two congresses were held in Santiago de Chile and, and Lima, and another in 1864, also in Peru. Representatives from different countries participated in these meetings in order to not let the Bolivarian idea die to revive the ideal of unity. And here I will mention some who play an important role. The Chilean Francisco Bilbao, the Uruguayan Jose Enrique Rodó, the Argentines Juan Bautista Alberdi, Juan Manuel de Rossi, Felipe Valera, the Puerto Rican Jose Maria de Hostos, the Honduran Francisco Morazán, the Colombian Jose Maria Torres Caicedo, and Jose Maria the apostle of the independence of Cuba. At that time, there were already men and women in our continent talking about Alba. It was not called Alba, but there was a plan for it. In Central America, for example, an Honduran living in Guatemala, Jose Cecilio del Valle, drafted a document which in Ibten 8 set forth an economic plan which reads as follows, take the necessary steps and prepare a general trade treaty for all the states of America, always respecting with the most liberal protection the reciprocal trade of one with the other and seeking the creation and promotion of the Navy that one party of the globe needs, separated by the seas from the others. These words are reflected today in the ALBA proposals. There were attempts in different latitudes to continue the Bolivarian ideal, the struggle of our peoples, but the Bolivarian ideal meant permanent intervention by the United States for our peoples. Latin America and the Caribbean have been living in this context for almost 22 hundred years, and Bolivar's idea, the idea of Latin American unity, the idea that move us now remain submerged and silenced. The Latin American peoples have no options. The very first option for freedom, which still exists today, was the triumph of the Cuban Revolution of January 1st, 1959, it brought to Latin America, to our con continent, a different option. And two decades later, in 1979, the popular Sandinista revolution succeeded, which also contributed in this sense. Why is it important to know all of this? Why is it so important for all of us to know that the history of our peoples was not born now? We are heirs of 200 years tradition of struggle, of of trying to keep Bolivar's legacy high. The last decade of the last century, from 90 to 2000, 
Following the end of the bipolar world and the demise of the Soviet Union and the socialist camp was a decade of chaos. It was about looking at what world we were going to have, how the world was going to be organized, and there was no clear idea. Most of the people wanted greater equity, a more democratic international institutional framework, a fairer redistribution of income, the disappearance of this consumerist and predatory model of our planet, greater equity in the distribution of resources, the use of resources since there will be no more wars, the use of resources for agriculture, scientific development, health and education. However, that didn't happen, and the peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean understood that we had to organize ourselves, organize ourselves in a different way, because what had happened in the 19th century, happened during the most of the 20th century, had not yielded positive results for the freedom and happiness of our peoples. Based on the idea of the fight against terrorism after September 11, 2001, the United States reorganized its military forces in our continent and in the world. The 20th century came to an end and the 21st century began. But before the end of the last century in Caracas, a bell was rung. In December 1998, in the popular elections, the Venezuelan people decided that this had to change and elected Commander Hugo Chavez as president of Venezuela. President Chavez came to power in a country that, although it was the fifth largest oil producer in the world, had 51% poverty, 20% poverty. It had 1,200,000 illiterate people, 1,400,000 children who couldn't go to school because their parents couldn't pay for it. A country where mothers saw their children dying because they didn't have health care. A country where all the oil went to the north, not a drop of oil to the south. We didn't have any oil agreement with the countries of South America. Then, President Chavez undertook the task of changing an unfair structure and began to recover the Bolivarian dream, the Bolivarian project interrupted in 1830 when the liberator died. And we began to get closer to the people. We launched a literacy campaign and in 2004 we were declared an illiteracy free territory by UNESCO. In 2003 we succeeded in incorporating all children to school, we reduced poverty to 33 percent and extreme poverty to nine percent. It is still high, but we will continue to lower it with all the social unemployment programs that the government is implementing, and most importantly, we started to be free in oil matters. We made great efforts. President Chavez himself made a great effort to revive OPEC. He visited one by one all the leaders of the oil-producing countries and succeeded in holding a new OPEC, OPEC summit in Caracas after almost 20 years. And this clearly didn't please the empire. It didn't like that. Being the ruler of the world, it couldn't lay the foundations and set the guidelines for the behavior of our countries. And then, based on that, we understood that we had the energy and that energy could and should be an instrument of liberation, an instrument for the independence of our peoples. We refer to energy, not just oil, because our continent has the world largest oil reserve, but also the largest gas, the largest water reserves, and the largest oxygen reserves in the Amazon. We understood that we had to protect that. We understood that we had to use it to serve the people. We understood that the path to freedom, the path to liberation, is no longer the political independence that we achieved at the beginning of the 19th century, but the economic independence that we had to achieve to be truly free was based on our resources being used to serve not only our own people, but also the people of Latin America and the Caribbean. And the Latin American peoples also had their own awareness and emancipation processes, and they emerged one after the other. Popular governments in several countries of the region began to develop progressive democratic processes, and so we gradually began to forge links. We began to know each other better 
and to understand that our needs were the same, trying to understand that we had complementary economies. What one lacked, the other had, and what the other had, the third lacked. And that if we were able to settle a fairer trade among our peoples, we would expand that space of freedom, and little by little, other countries with governments that may have a greater or lesser relationship with the empire joined in, but that finally they are governments to which the necessity forces, the world crisis, has brought them closer to their counterparts in Latin America and the Caribbean. Today, the crisis is not only affecting one single aspect, but it is already multiple. It's energy, food, financial, in such a way that it's taking shape as a total crisis, which, moreover, doesn't affect only one country in a specific area, but it is already possible to see signs that it could turn into a structural crisis of the capitalist system. I have tried to outline what is happening in the world in Latin America to our peoples, the conclusions we can draw, giving us elements of why we should buy, build ALBA, because conditions have been emerging to resume Bolivar's project. Not only Bolivar's, but the project of our founding fathers of Latin America and the Caribbean, our Caribbean, as Martí called How did Bolívar see the future of our America? This is what he said in 1814. I quote, it is essential that the forces of our nation be capable of successfully resisting any aggression that may be attempted by European ambition. And such giant-like strength, which must oppose that the other giant can be attained only through the union of the whole of South America as one national body, so that one central government can concentrate its great abilities on one single end, that is to resist with all its might any attacks on it from outside, while within its confined mutual cooperation, should increase and flourish, raising us to the heights of power and prosperity." End of the quote. Later, in 1815, he wrote the letter from Jamaica. I, I quote, the idea of merging the entire new world into a single nation with a single unifying principle to provide coherence to the parts and to the whole is grandiose because it has a common origin, a common language, similar custom, and one religion. We might conclude that it should be possible for a single government to oversee a federation of the different states eventually to emerge. End of the quote. And in 1818, Bolivar said, I quote, when the victory of the Venezuelan forces has secured its independence, or when more favorable circumstances allow us to communicate more frequently and maintain closer relations, we will hasten on our part to draw up an American pact which, by forming a single political body of all our republic, will show America to the world in a light of majesty a grandeur unrevived by the nations of antiquity, thus united if heaven should grant this fervent wish, America could truly call herself the queen of nations and the mother of republics. Those stronger communications and closer relations that Bolivar hoped would be forged at the end of the war only remained and exist in Alba. He couldn't fully focus on that goal because the pity ambitions of the oligarchy were stronger in our newly independent nations. Bolivar, in 1815, in the letter of Jamaica, taught us that we are strong because we are different. What have been tough in schools and in society? What have been tough? We have been told that we are weak because we are different. The truth is that being different makes us strong. We said that we are a continent with reserve of water, gas, and oil. We had land to feed the whole world if we were planted. But we need financial resources to do so, so we need cooperation. An orphan cooperation, if it doesn't have other elements, if it doesn't have humanitarian sense and respect for the sovereign of peoples, it's worthless because cooperation cannot be used as a colonial instrument, as an instrument of domination, as a modern instrument of domination. Our cooperation within the framework of ALBA must be based on solidarity. Solidarity means unconditional cooperation. Cooperation cannot be imposed. 
Those who have resources can offer them to those who don't have them, but the decision to receive it, where to receive it, and what to receive it for has to be made by the resident. We cannot say to a broader country, I will help you build, build schools, but I decided where to build them. That is not cooperation, that is intervention. ALBA cooperation is decided by the member countries by common agreement without impositions because we worked based on equity and complementarity. This means that cooperation doesn't involve aggressive donors or passive recipients. Rather, in ALBA, complementarity means that everyone contributes what they can. We must all be equal participants. Other principle of ALBA is sovereignty. Every action taken within ALBA framework must be based on unrestricted respect for the sovereignty of each country. This is a sine qua non condition for participation in ALBA. Another principle is equal participation. In ALBA, I would like to repeat, we are not recipients or donors of cooperation. All ALBA members are participants. These are the ALBA's guiding principles. This is the different approach we want to build, taking control of the Bolivarian government once again. What are we today? What is ALBA? Today we are already 10 countries. We have almost two and a half million square kilometers and we have over 50 million inhabitants. That is what we are. We are no longer small. Today we are an alliance with two and a half million square kilometers. We are present in the Caribbean. We are in the heart of the Andes of South America. We are in the Caribbean. We speak English and Spanish. We are in the heart of Central America and in the north of South America. We speak Aymara, Quechua, Guarani, Spanish and English. And yet we understand each other very well, even though we don't speak all those languages. And soon we will speak others. ALBA is a reality that has to become better. It has to improve every day. It is a project that is not totally written. It is a new project that nobody is doing in particular. It is a project that is being built by our people. We, have, we are a synergy of social organizations and government parties. We cannot be separate. We must unite around the Bolivarian idea and obtain results. One of the features that ALBA should have is that it should be a collective construction. No one has the absolute truth here. Nobody knew, knew how it was going to happen. Nobody knew how the social movement was going to happen. So the creativity, the great wisdom of our people is what we have to use to build this project that belongs to all of us. Only 20 years ago, this was born, and nobody knew how it, it was going to be. It emerged from Fidel and Chavez ideas, and thus began to materialize the rebirth of the Bolivarian ideal made reality with us, with the mere certainty that we have to be united. We are showing that it is possible, but it has to be with the participation of all. It has to be with our conscious participation, creating, thinking, contributing on the path to our second independence. That is the purpose of ALBA. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Sergio Rodriguez. It is the vindication of the Bolivarian Union today expressed in ALBA TCP. But it goes beyond ALBA, as Sergio himself has said. Uh, it starts from the dispute and confrontation between the Monroe Doctrine uh, in 1823 and the immediate response of the liberator Simon Bolivar when he convened the Amphitheonic Congress of Panama and developed that unitary thesis, that doctrine of unity of our Latin America and the Caribbean, as Pedro Sazón would say. It is unresolved dispute, as Sergio says, but in difficult times, uh, the wills have been there. Even in the 19th century, Sergio referred to several union initiatives that took place in South America among great intellectual and political scholars 
who didn't succeed, who confront the Pan-Americanism of the United States with that false equality and false unity that they tried to build and which resulted in the OAS, in the Organization of American States, and all of that we have seen and how in the 90s the chaos was so evident that the Bolivarian re proposal revived at the end of that decade with the coming to power of, com of Commander Hugo Chavez and emerged the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America with the same principles that Sergio developed, cooperation, solidarity, complementarity, and with the Bolivarian spirit present in a cooperation that must be unconditional. Sergio told us, not a conditional cooperation in which I can solve some situation or provide you with some resources, but under the condition that you accept an economic policy or a particular political position. No, it is a cooperation for liberation. That is Alba TCP, the dimensions of Alba, its power. Thank you very much, Sergio Rodriguez. And and we are going to listen now as the last lecture in the seminar on Latin American unity against imperial geopolitics to Professor Mireya Bolet. She is a graduate expert in education from the Simon Rodriguez University, expert in Simon Rodriguez and his ideas. And at this moment, she's going to make a presentation on new technologies and Latin American unity. Go ahead, Professor. I would like to extend my greetings to the Alba TCP member countries, especially to its executive secretary, Dr. Jorge Arreaz. The occasion in which I'm participating uh, allows me to develop the topic the Latin American and Caribbean University in the face of generative artificial intelligence used as a project of current global domination from a psychopolitical perspective. The purpose of this research is to develop a counter-hegemonic perspective to show some aspects of what the current project of global domination represents for the Latin American and Caribbean Union through the dissemination and use of contents based on generative artificial intelligence. Generative artificial intelligence is a branch of artificial intelligence that focuses on the creation of systems capable of creating content by emulating the human creative process. This process goes through two stages. A creative process in which content is produced and a process that, uh, for many, is unknown, involving competing adversarial neural networks, both the one that creates the content and the one that monitors uh, uh, the contents disseminated clearer given this reality suggests that contents are manipulated. Especially when we talk about this network, we only think of images. That is, we say that this network is used to determine the quality of an image when someone requests it. For example, if you ask for a cat, you will not get a dog. But we know that none of this is innocent, that it is intentional, that everything is planned, right? It is not going to be left to chance. And of course, we are facing a reality in which this intelligence and its use, as people said, and it is really going to be like that, probably in the future, even though we don't have a good, bad opinion, we believe that artificial intelligence, uh, we believe that artificial intelligence can also make a contribution, especially in the education field. And me, as a graduate professor, I have seen its possibilities. However, we have also witnessed 
uh, some situations emerging when generative artificial intelligence provides, provides answers that do not correspond to what it should be responding to. And the creators of these systems refer to them as hallucinations. It is always about representing generative artificial intelligence with images evoking humans. But we should know that is not human, that is really a machine like any other machines to which you ask questions and they process what they have collected through internet and give us the answer. Then, when they are wrong, they call it hallucinations. Hallucination is an immediately human process. They also talk about empathy. And they have it up to the cognitive part, because they will never get to the emotional part. That's why their texts are plain and linear, right? But again, about the evaluation of the content, they will not make statements because it is not explicit. This is a hidden mechanism where there is surely an ide ideological political concession. There are biases of interest. There are stereotypes, false information uh, that, as I said, they call hallucinations, like when we see a tweet and we say that it is a fake news. It is a completely human quality, as I said, but this mechanism allows generative artificial intelligence to create realities as well as people and characters. Characters. The danger is that, uh, for example, the instructions can change political ideological preferences. They can even replace the instructions of a political party. And of course, there is a cultural domination purpose. Uh, regarding the method we are using uh, this time, uh, we are uh, using uh, some categories coming from psychopolitics as a technique. Psychological truth uh, that is used to manipulate, seduce, and influence people's emotions, beliefs, and behaviors in order to achieve ideological political goals. Theoretically, uh, in terms of psychopolitics, we rely on books and analyses made by the contemporary philosopher Bin Chul Hong when he refers to how technology with massive use by the entire world affects society. We works on the, he works on the concept of uh, burnout and portrays a very accurate picture of what the new information and communication technologies mean which could be Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and so on, because they create addictions. People are already addicted to machines, and we see it every day when we see photos of a family eating while everyone is on their cell phones. In other words, there is almost an interruption of human communication. We also see when this philosopher not only speaks of the burnout society, but also of the swarm. That is what bees work for. They work alone, they work individually, and we already know who they work for, don't we? And he talks about the swarm in the digital era as a process. Let's say, as a metaphor, because of this behavior where people work for themselves, they become their own bosses, and therefore that wipe out, wipes out the possibility of a protest or a class struggle because people get used not to live in community but to live alone. He also refers to the so called pseudo freedom, particularly uh, when we talk about generative 
artificial intelligence. We see that almost everything comes ready-made. If you ask to write a problem, it is capable of writing a, a thesis, it is capable of researching, it writes a letter, an invitation, that is to say, it offers many possibilities. But what comes along with that easiness that brings to you? It is certainly offering free time. I am a professional, and I know that when I had to develop a program, it took me a lot of time, a lot of reading. In other words, I had to spend a lot of time. And now, simply entering what they call the instruction, in less than five minutes, I have the program back with evaluation, biography, references, and so on. Well, uh, that's the reality we are living, isn't it? And let's say that the way we relate to each other is influenced by these new technologies. So under that framework, how do we do to promote unity? When we talk about Latin American and Caribbean unity, we are currently witnessing no Non-progressive governments attacking three countries in particular, Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, which are, uh, which are in the spotlight due to the greater possibility of rebellion and revolt, uh, no, of uh, defending sovereignty. So we also rely on each other. Uh, for this work, we are developing on the ALBA TCP principles, which in the culture and education fields are fields are committed to the union from an, from an a structural perspective, involving collaboration, solidarity, and joint action among different human, ethnic, cultural, and geographic groups that have been historically united elements. And uh, I feel sorry to see that the unity we're focusing on is being disturbed because we see, for example, the attacks on Venezuelan immigration, which is very sad, of course. Given such conditions, we will have to think about what kind of unity we are betting on. Under these conditions, what are we going to do? Many people even talk about the fact that children and young people have changed the shape of the human skeleton because they are doing so much uh, through cell phones and computers that there is a different uh, configuration of the human body. But apart from that, what we are interested in working on is our political ideology. Just as they have a political ideology, we also have ours. Isn't it different? In other words, we are not focusing on that uh, human being. We are focusing on the regional solidarity. We are focusing on the feeling of unity, on the affection among human beings. Because even though I told you before that there are opposed governments that really threaten unity, uh, it is important to reach the people, to reach the grassroots because that is where new societies can be built, uh, that is to say, to work for the future. From the strength that ALBA TCP represents for the Latin American and Caribbean region, uh, it is necessary from our platform to generate discourses and policies in favor of the union of our America. And from that space to build uh, those counter hegemonic strategies, create resistance and offensive content. For example, we can use what they use as a basis uh, for education. 
to get into the mind and change perspectives and uh, positions. Uh, we also have uh, the possibility of inserting our own content. So I think we have a great opportunity because if we start to create content, we are neutralizing them and we are also imposing our own. I invite you to do an exercise that I have already done. Uh, I put, tell me who is Mireya Bolet. And it told me, I don't know who she is. I wrote them further down in one of these models. Uh, I wrote Mireya Bolet and I was adding features of my own life. And the next question was, who is Mireya Bolet? And it gave me back everything I had written. So instead of being a weakness, it is a strength. Because if we create our own content, we are doing what we should do. Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to express what has been the subject of con concern for quite a long time. In fact, from the Simón Rodríguez University, well, I opened a WhatsApp uh, a chat last year called Collaborators or Competitors, Professors in the New Era of Artificial Intelligence. We have over 300 people with whom we interact, and they are from different countries. It is a chat that became international because we included someone, and that someone was included someone else, and so on. We really had an international WhatsApp. So I believe that if everyone contributes from their own perspective, we can achieve great things. Thank you. Well, this has been the first edition of the Seminar of Latin American Unity Against Imperial Geopolitics. And we have uh, very valuable reflections and approaches from um, these comrades who, who have shed their light in this first seminar, which should be the first of many and should result in a series of publications and which, which should also encourage us to include you, dear diplomats and colleagues of international relations, in our countries and those who tune in to this seminar, well, let us find those experts, wise men and women, women who want to contribute in this open space of Alba TCP as well as in alliance with Pueblos Institute, which is an institute for original thinking that emerges from Venezuela for the countries of our Latin America and the Caribbean and for the world and how we are going to build that Latin American pole of power, how we resume the liberator Simón Bolívar, those generations, Fidel Castro and Hugo Chávez, who created Alba TCP as a strategic goal. It was not Alba TCP per se, but how from Alba, from the Bolivarian Alliance countries, we can help to consolidate the unity of our Latin America and the Caribbean and that great pole of power to face and win the dispute, to stop being in dispute in our continent, which has been so, sin so since our birth, and the peoples take the reins of their present, of their future, and achieve liberation in our new multipolar world. Thank you very much. We hope it has been useful, and we look forward to your reflections. See you very soon in the new edition of the seminar Latin American Unity Against Imperial Geopolitics.